Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to this webinar on financial well-being. Um, this evening, it's being delivered by um, experts and skilled professionals at Mattioli Woods um, in partnership with Rugby League Cares. So uh, we've, we've enjoyed a partnership at the charity for a number of years with Mattioli Woods, uh, providing, you know, expert advice and support around everything to do with our finances. We, we, we thought that financial well-being is, is real integral to our whole person well-being and has been able to feel good and function well. Um, it's also an area of focus that sort of our main stakeholders in the form of our players um, in the game, uh, they're consistently feeding back the desire to, to further their education, um, their knowledge and their expertise um, around, around a range of different topic areas within this space. Um, so the hope this evening is this will support you somewhat in achieving those aims and, ob and objectives. Um, so without further ado, I will pass over to Adrian um, at Matilda Woods. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and good evening, everybody. It's a, a real pleasure to be with you this evening. And uh, yeah, as, uh, as Steve mentioned, talking about the topic of managing money and managing finances. Uh, just very quickly, for those that don't know me or haven't met me before, because... I have spent a little bit of time going around some of the clubs and meeting uh, some of the player welfare managers, etc. My name is Adrian Firth. I work for a company called Mattioli Woods. And, and you may be wondering why on earth we're involved with Rugby League Cares. Um, so I suppose just to give you um, a little bit of background, um, we are a fairly successful um, wealth management and investment company. Um, we're based in Leicester. If any of you follow Rugby, League, uh, Rugby Union at all, the other code, you will know that we're quite closely associated with Leicester Tigers because our head office is based on Welford Road, the same road as, as, as Leicester Tigers, and, and we help them out. Um, because we manage over £15 billion worth of money and assets, um, it does give us a certain leeway to give back our time and give back our energies and um, financial contributions to charities and third sector organisations. And that's why we support Rugby League Cares, because they're one of the panel of charities that we give our time and our money to to try and uh, help people um, and look after professional rugby league players because we like the sport of rugby generally. Now, this, this session is being recorded, so I do have some legal bits to get through, unfortunately. Uh, the first one is that I just want to let everybody know that the information is correct at the time of this recording being taken, and it does relate to the 2023-24 tax year. The other piece of legal information we have to get through before we start is that we're not here to give anybody any financial advice whatsoever. Uh, we are, though, just going to be taking a practical look at the topic of taking control of money, uh, looking at finances and, and trying to set ourselves some small objectives that we can easily achieve uh, over the coming months. And that harks back to what Steve was saying earlier, that we're very interested in the whole of person well-being for professional rugby league players and people involved in rugby league. And that whole of person, um, certainly uh, for us at Matty Holy Woods, is looking at helping people with their mental well-being, their physical well-being. But obviously, this session is all to do with the, the financial well-being uh, side of things. Now, I'm not on my own during the evening tonight. Uh, I do have one of my colleagues who's hiding in the background. Uh, some of you may uh, again have, have met Mark Redmond, my colleague, uh, but he is here on this webinar purely for you to interact with whilst I'm talking. So you should see on the right hand side of your screen, there's a section called Q&A. Uh, underneath the Q, if you click on Q&A underneath that, you'll see there's a text box. If you type a question or make a comment or disagree with me about anything that we're presenting on the way through tonight, that will go through to Mark. Um, and it's in private and in confidence. So whatever you type in there, it isn't broadcast to everybody else. It's just between you and Mark. And he'll hopefully have the time to type responses back and enter into a conversation with, with the people that are on the webinar tonight. Should we get a question and we can't answer it tonight, we do have people's email addresses. So we can email you tomorrow with a response to the question that you might have asked if we don't know the answer, because we don't know everything about everything. But it does remind me again to mention that we only use your email address 
to reply to you if you ask a question or have an outstanding issue at the end of the webinar. We do not use your email addresses for third party marketing. We don't give them over to any other organizations and we do fully delete them all after the webinar is being completed so that we're not holding any data on any individuals. Um, and Mark hates me saying this, but he has absolutely nothing else to do this evening other than wait for you to put a comment or a question in that box. So on the way through, if I mention something and you want to find out more, please pop it in there and Mark will come back. And also I'll invite Mark and Steve back on at the end uh, and we'll do a few questions and answers as well. So the reason for putting this session together was simply to look at what's changed. Uh, this is something that's topical and up to date because unless you've been living in a cave, you must appreciate uh, that we are living in a turbulent economic time. So if we look back over the last uh, 12 years or so in the lead up to COVID, uh, we were in a period of a very flat economic uh, period, very uh, uh, stable. Interest rates were incredibly low. Growth was very steady in our UK economy. And what we found uh, in the last 18 months in particular is that after some lunatic started a war in Eastern Europe and post COVID, when our economy was just starting to recover, we have a whole heap of economic issues as a result of those lockdowns and the supply of natural resources that we would expect from Eastern Europe. Uh, and so I think it's pertinent that we start off with actually looking at what has changed. Uh, now, we, we use statistics that are provided by the Office of National Statistics, and they always run three months behind where the current position is. I think they have actually done some updates to these figures, which we've not had a chance to filter into our slides yet. But nevertheless, you are going to get you know, the basic information from this. And I don't think you need me to remind you very much about what has changed over the last 12 months or so. But the food and catering index, which is the food prices and the prices that we pay for the things that are on the shelf in the supermarket, Again, I'm sure you've seen the news headlines, but we are looking at around 16.6% increase up to the end of May 2023. Um, and, you know, again, that is something which is going to seriously affect every single person's standard of living on this webinar, because it doesn't matter how much you earn or how much money you have. That is just going to eat away at the amount of disposable income that you have after that. And, and coupled together with that, obviously, I've mentioned the war in Eastern Europe, but that spiked uh, our fuel prices, as you can see in, in 2022. I'd like to say that they've come down further than June 2023 when we saw them at an average of 143.6. Um, as I was speaking to groups of people about this about three weeks ago, um, well, we were at 134 as an average, but we are now, unfortunately, uh, this month or this week, back up to the 140s. Uh, so, you know, that is going to affect how much it costs us to put fuel in the car. And of course, the big one is our, our energy consumption. Um, you know, I would like to point out that the £2,500 figure that you can see there, which was a, a fixed or a capped rate for an average UK household, well, first of all, it wasn't £2,500, it was £2,100 because we received a winter fuel allowance of £400 per household, which was added on to our bills in increments of £66 and £66, pence uh, over the course of winter. You can see there the current average uh, price is 2074 but that's pretty much exactly the same as the 2100 that we had through winter. So we are really on a par with how much we're paying for gas and electricity. But my second point on this is, that it is to do with the unitary rates that we pay. So it isn't that you're going to pay 2,500. It is the, if you use more, then you're going to pay more. So um, that is very much the case. We're in summer at the moment, but as we transition into autumn and into winter, it is something to bear in mind. Um, Mark and Steve and I were chatting before the webinar started, and there was a little bit from Cambridge Analytics about what we expect to happen with the, the uh, fuel prices. They are expected to drop a little bit in the next quarter, but then go back up a little bit in the quarter after that. And those are every three month periods. So it is going to stay fairly close to the amount that you can see there. Now, if we couple all of that together, the knock on effect of those increases and rises are that, um, you know, the cost of living has increased quite dramatically.
which means that uh, inflation has taken hold in our economy, which means that the Bank of England, in, in its attempt to try and rein in inflation, has increased interest rates. And there's been much in the press about the rise in interest rates. If you were a saver, that should be good news because the bank should be offering us more money and they are slowly bringing their interest rates up to reasonable levels for us to save money. However, if we're a borrower or a debtor, then the cost of borrowing as a knock-on effect from that will increase quite dramatically over the coming months. And I'll have a look at that in a little bit more detail uh, later on. But despite all of that, I think we can come back to the basics of managing money. And I have three golden rules that everybody should have when we're managing our day to day finances is do I need it? Can I afford it? And can I get it cheaper? And you should ask these questions whenever you're buying small or big purchases. During lockdown, we got really good at using these things to order everything that we need and get it delivered through to our door. And we seem to have lost the ability in the last 12 months of using these to cost everything up. So with two thumbs and 30 seconds, you should be able to see if something looks like good value for money or whether you should pass on it and move on and go and do something else with your money and your time. But I think the key thing, certainly um, uh, in, in rugby league circles, is, you know, do I really need it? Do I really need something big and brash and flash or, uh, you know, uh, could I make do with, with something more sensible? And, and you know, I, I certainly think that with any purchase, you can always get something cheaper than the headline figure that you're being offered so that you don't get tied into things that are very expensive and tie you down. The overriding rule here is that we are not looking for people to save thousands of pounds in one go. You might be able to do that if, if you really change something dramatic. But in order to maintain our standard of living as it is and not lose out to these increases in costs, then we need to look for five pounds a month here and 10 pounds a month there, which adds up to the hundreds of pounds at the end of the year. And if you're thinking about something like gas and electricity and you're paying 400, five pound, 500 uh, pounds a year more for the gas and electricity, well, if we can find five pounds a month here and 10 pounds a month there, that's going to add up to mitigating that increased cost, which keeps our standard of living the way it was. And that's all we're trying to find. And I'm speaking on that subject, before we move on and talk about other things, uh, I do have a few things that I think are really important for everybody with their personal finances right now. And if you bear with me, I'll just quickly run through a few things and try not to take up too much of your time. First of all, just to update you on what's been happening in the insurance world. If any of you on here have had a car insurance renewal recently, you will have noticed that it's gone up quite dramatically. Now, the reason for that isn't anything to do with inflation in our economy or the cost of providing goods and services. It's actually to do with some legislation that was brought in 12 months ago, which was to stop what we call price walking. And that is that insurance companies were offering cheaper deals to new customers than they were doing to their existing customers. Now, the that was unfair. So they brought in legislation to stop that from happening. And as a result, unfortunately, the cost of any insurance has gone up. That's travel insurance, home insurance, car insurance, any other kind of life insurance, any other kind of insurance policy that you're looking for. Now, on the flip side of the coin, the vast majority of people do not shop around for their insurance when it comes up for renewal. Most people accept a, a renewal, um, which is just slightly higher than it was the previous year. And so you go, yeah, I can't be bothered changing anything. Let's just roll it over. So now is a great time to get in touch with um, the meerkats and, and the opera singers of this world. I make no apology. I'm not allowed to mention products and services too much on the way through this because the idea is not to sell you anything or promote a product or a service. But the opera singers and meerkats of this world, you know who they are. The, the online supermarkets, they can go across all, you know, nearly all insurance providers to try to find the best deal. And you're going to have to do that when your insurance policies come up for renewal. So that if you have a note in your diary when they're going to come up, you need to be looking three week, three to four weeks in advance of that insurance product coming up for renewal. That's the optimal time to be looking at it. 
Now, obviously, you can get better interest on cash. Uh, you can see here 6% on savings accounts. There are a couple in the marketplace at the moment. But the other reminder for me on this one is to not overlook things like your current account or things that you carry around in your purse or your wallet on a regular basis. Uh, with your current account, if you've had it for more than a couple of years, you can switch to another provider. Uh, remember, current accounts do exactly the same thing. Um, but there are some really good deals in the marketplace. So you might even get paid 100, 150 quid just for switching your current account across to a new provider. It's really easy. It takes about 20 to 25 minutes online to fill in the application forms. You want to make sure you do it through the government-backed switching service. And then the only other thing you need to do is have a chat with the payroll and let them know that you've changed your account and to pay the money into a new account. Everything transfers across standing orders, direct debits, absolutely everything. There's no reason not to do it every couple of years um, and take advantage of the offers that are there. Also, some of them offer free insurance deals as well. So that gets you out of the insurance um, policy increases as well. So have a look at that. Really good deals. Um, I don't know if many people on here undertake long journeys from time to time, but this is just a reminder. If you are going to undertake a longer journey, just do consider the cheapest way of getting there. Because with increasing fuel prices and the prices at the pump are expected to increase again from the 140s that we looked at earlier, we are back to thinking about whether the car is the most economical one or flying or rail travel and particularly off-peak rail travel, which is incredibly cheap if you go online and compare deals. So just some very, very quick ideas there. Um, also, uh, you know, I'm not going to patronize people by telling you not to have the latest mobile phone and the latest tech. But when it does come up for renewal, which it will do for most people that are on here in the next 12 month period, do you really need a new phone? My phone's still got a home button on it. I really don't care. It works absolutely fine. It just keeps slotting sims into them and going again. Um, so, you know, just the question is, can you save a little bit across that? And that's the same as, as broadband. You might be wondering why it's up here. Um, but there was a recent piece of research uh, done um, by usave.co.uk, which showed that the cost of just broadband is on average in the UK is £43.71. But the cost of broadband with a phone line or with another product added on is £39.75. So that tells me you don't even have to plug a phone line in. Just say you want to add that onto your service. See if it can get you a discount, which it may well do. And again, this is going to save you that £5 a month, which is really uh, counting towards saving those hundreds of pounds over the course of the year. The last one on the list, I know, is one of Mark's favorites. He's in the background, not saying much, but hopefully answering your questions and comments. If you want to put them uh, in the Q&A box on the right hand side, good reminder there. Um, but um, you do have to be careful with uh, asking a council to reassess your council tax. There's quite a bit of work you can do before that. And that is through .gov.uk, which is the government's website. And there's a section on there called the Valuations Office Agency. Um, and on there, you can get lots of useful information about the valuations of your property in your area and whether or not you think you might be able to transfer to a lower council tax banding as a result of just checking. Now, the reason for mentioning this is back in 1991, when it was introduced, uh, if you live in a home that's older than 1991, then this is available to you to check out. We didn't have enough surveyors in the UK to go around and survey every property. So what they did was they just looked out the window and said, everybody over there is going to be in that band and everybody over there, over there is going to be in that band. And as a result of that, a lot of people ended up in the wrong bands or higher bands than they needed to be. Um, so you can petition the council to go into a lower band if you've done your research beforehand. However, just a quick warning shot with this one. They do reserve the right to put you in a higher band if they feel that your property should be in a higher band. And not only that, but secondly, they also reserve the right to reassess the properties around you. So not only might you end up paying a bit more money, but you might be really, really unpopular with your neighbors if they get reassessed as well. Anyway, something to look at. And those things that we've just run through are all little things that I think everybody should be doing to be looking after their finances on a regular basis, just to keep chipping away and make sure that we've got the best deal with everything that we do. 
Of course, if we're going to look after our financial well-being, one of the biggest things that can affect our well-being, and this is coming to the fore now more than it has done in the last 10 years, is the cost of debt and borrowing. Because if we are carrying debts along with us, these are the things that are going to be severely affected by the economic climate and by the rising interest rates that have been increasing at the Bank of England. The knock-on effect is that if you have something variable like a credit card uh, or a store card or an overdraft facility, it is very easy for the banks to very quickly change those rates and put them up. So if you are carrying balances on any of those, those are the ones that are going to be increasing the fastest and are usually the most expensive because they're designed to be short-term borrowing not long-term solutions. And, and in the field of, of, of rugby league and in, in coming into contact with players, as I have done throughout the season so far, there are a number of individuals who are carrying balances or um, amounts of money on what were designed to be short-term borrowing but being run over a long period of time. And that's one area where we've been sitting down and helping them and making sure that we pay off the most expensive first and then we work backwards from there. So some like a mortgage is going to be one of the cheapest borrowings that you have because if it was set in that period when we had low interest rates it will be a very efficient way to borrow large amounts of money but i'm going to come on to mortgages in a second because those will also be affected by rising interest rates i guess the key thing is you should always shop around for the best deal don't be afraid to say okay i have a credit card here but i'm looking for a better one Go online and have a look and see if it can be easily transferred. There are still 0% deals in the marketplace to transfer onto. And that is the same with store cards or overdraft facilities. You can transfer them onto a 0% deal and help to alleviate the pressure of rising interest rates, which we were speaking about earlier. Um, I did want to mention mortgages. Uh, and I did want to mention the mortgage market in particular, because if we go back to what we were looking at, the things that are affecting us in the economy at the moment, rising interest rates are number one. And the vast majority of people um, on this webinar, uh, and certainly, um, you know, my, myself included, uh, rates will have been set at a time when they were historically much lower. But when we come to the end of our fixed rate deal, which is going to happen over the following 12 months, 24 months or 36 months, and um, we are going to tip on to much higher rates and they are going to be in excess of three times more as an interest rate than what we were paying for the mortgages when they were set at historically low levels. So we really do need to think about what's going to happen. And we need to think about that six months in advance of when our mortgages are going to come to an end because that's the earliest opportunity that we can find a deal. And we need to do that quickly at the six months before the end of our deal and get that signed, sealed and put in place. Because if interest rates continue to rise from that point, well, we got a good deal. I know it's not a good deal because it's more expensive than it was before, but it's not as bad as it could have been if it had carried on going up. If interest rates go down, as we hope they do in a year to 18 months time, well, then we can get rid of that deal and we can go on to a lower deal and we can keep renegotiating it right up to the point where we're at the end of that, that fixed rate deal that we set. For first time buyers that are on here, um, we are still uh, looking at four and a half times salary as an amount which banks will agreeably loan to you. Um, if you're getting a mortgage with a partner or a spouse, you can take your joint income and you can do four and a half times that joint income. Uh, so again, you know, if you earn £30,000, you'd be looking at borrowing as a maximum of £135,000. But if you were clubbing together with a partner and managed to have £60,000 worth of income, uh, which is double, then you could borrow £270,000. However, the cost of servicing that £270,000 is at an historical high at the moment because of the rising interest rates. Any existing mortgage holders on here? I, you know, I've already been through this six months before a deal is due to come to a head. That's the point at, need, at which you need to renegotiate. And I'm conscious as well that rugby players are very interested in second properties for rental income. Uh, and again, it's exactly the same principle with that. Six months before they're due to come up for renewal, that's the point at which you want to be renegotiating it with your, more, with your commercial mortgage provider. And then you'll be able to uh, you know, sort that out. 
just one last thing on mortgages. If you are finding that it is going to be a very big struggle to meet the really high interest rates that we have at the moment, then you might want to consider on the flip side of the coin and don't do it unless you have to, but you might want to consider the term over which you're repaying that mortgage. You might want to consider maybe resetting it because first time buyers at the moment are not doing mortgages over 25 years. Lenders are extending that period to over 30 years or 35 years in order to reduce the monthly outgoings to service that mortgage and make sure that people can stay in their property and repay the loan. So term is also something that you might want to consider, although because if you do stretch it over a longer period of time, you end up paying more interest and the whole thing becomes more expensive as a whole. But I appreciate that the monthly payments are slightly lower if it's over that longer period of time. All right. It is time for me to wake you all up a little bit on the webinar this evening. I do have a very quick poll for you. If you bear with me, I'm going to pop it on screen. So you should have a poll to answer on screen. And that includes you, Steve, in the background as well. Please do let me know if you've had a look at your credit score recently. So either yes, I, you know, I'm one of those people who has a look at my credit score regularly, or no, I've got absolutely no idea what you're on about and I haven't looked at it. If you could vote now using the yes or no buttons, I do have to pad for about 20 seconds while those answers come through to me and I can um, you know, cut that off and get back to the presentation. Uh, I think we're almost there. Just waiting for one last one. There we go. So we are split at about two thirds of us have checked our credit score. That means you probably heard me speak before about how important it is to look at your credit score. Um, one third of us uh, haven't looked at our credit score before. So this should be really uh, interesting for you. Let me just uh, move on one more slide. There we go. Why am I interested in talking about credit scores? Well, it's a really important part of your overall financial well-being is to know where you stand. The only way you'll know where you stand is to dip in and have a look at your credit score and make sure that you have a good credit score. You might be asking, well, why do I need to make sure I've got a good credit score? Quite simply, if you've got a good score, you're going to get access to good products and good services from the financial services industry. But vice versa, if you've got a poor credit score or a bad credit score, you're going to get access to poor or bad products from the financial services industry. So this is really, really important thing to keep on top of, particularly in light of what we were speaking about before with mortgages and loans, with changing deals. What they are going to do is check your credit reference file to make sure that you've got a decent credit score and then they'll give you decent rates for you to move on to. But vice versa, if you've got a poor credit score, you're going to find you've got very high interest rates because the risk is higher because of something that might be affecting your credit score. Go on, have a look. It's free to do. It doesn't cost any money. You can see on screen the main companies that do that. Again, I can't recommend any one of them. They're all much of a muchness. They all do pretty much the same thing, similar services, and they've all got a free option for you to have a look at your credit score. When you do, just one quick tip on that. Don't just look at your credit score. Sitting alongside it is a credit report. And the report is the bit that you want to look at. And that is a list of all the financial products that you've got in your financial armory and your recent history of how you've managed those products. That's the bit you need to check to make sure it's all right. If something's affecting your credit score, it will definitely be in the report as to the reason why. And then you can get that sorted out. You can chat to us if you need any help with it. Um, I appreciate that there might be some young people on here because rugby league players tend to be younger rather than my age, which is older. So just some things that you can do to make sure that you keep a good credit score. And that is make sure you've got the right names and addresses on all of your accounts. Sounds pretty simple, but you can get marked down if you're just too lazy and can't be bothered doing that. Also, make sure you're registered to vote. Uh, get yourself onto the electoral roll um, and just make sure that you're responsible with the financial products that you've got, which will reflect well on you. I often um, get the comment back that, well, you know, I'm in the country for a couple of years and then I may be leaving the country again. That's fine. Simple things like a mobile phone contract, that is a credit agreement. So again, you know, you will get access to that kind of thing and that will help to build up a credit file 
while you're here in the UK. So um, we've talked about the economic circumstances, interest rates, the big worry over what high interest rates does to borrowing. Um, we've had a quick look at taking control of our money and giving ourselves a few jobs to do over the coming months about saving ourselves a little bit of money here and there. Uh, what happens at the other end of things if we want to you know, start to become a saver? Well, just to introduce you to the topic of actually creating some financial security, which will really empower your financial well-being to be much happier than it would be if everything was borrowing. Um, I did want to just make sure you're aware that within your personal finances, you will have different things that you want to achieve. And they can be quite easily broken down into the short-term stuff, the medium term stuff and the long term stuff. Now, the long term stuff to start with is really easy because that's putting some money aside to make sure you can look after yourself when you not just maybe transition from rugby league, but when you actually come to stopping work. So that's much later in life. And that is working part time, more holidays, transitioning into your retirement. So that's the very end of your working life. Uh, just be a member of a pension scheme, get the tax efficiency, get the employer's contribution on top of yours. And that is a good aim and a good objective for your long term financial security. Short term financial planning. There isn't much we can do about it if you've overlooked it. It is birthdays, holidays, Christmases, um, you know, uh, maybe saving up to buy a home, maybe clearing some debts off. That is everything that you want to achieve in the next 12 to 18 months. And again, we can't really do much about that. We can we can focus on it, but we can't change much in that. The medium term things are where action um, can be a little bit different. Number one, if you've not got a medium term financial plan, now's the time to start one. It's some it's some of the things that might help you like transitioning over to a new career and just having a small pot of money that might help you with that transition period. It might be things like moving home. Well, we could move that further back it, with high interest rates if we're struggling to move up to a newer and bigger and more expensive property. So we might be able to move that around a little bit. Maybe starting a family again, we, we can really decide when we want to do that. Um, and maybe with the cost of living can think about, well, maybe that seventh child might have to wait for another 12 months until interest rates come back down a little bit. Um, but, you know, I really do want people to pay attention to those three key areas of their finances. Short term stuff that's really right upon us. Make sure we've got enough money to do all those things and, and do them well. Medium term, make sure we're saving towards the things that we want to achieve that might be in the next three to six years. Uh, and then the long term is just to have one eye on that. Make sure we're a member of a pension scheme and we're putting something to one side. If we have the capacity to do more in that area, then that's absolutely great. What do we need to do to make sure that we can get those three different areas of our finances sorted out? Well, this is the good news for everybody on here because we just need to sit down with a pencil and a piece of paper and work out what we've got, where it's going, and just have a plan for our money. Again, it doesn't matter um, whether you're on the national minimum wage or whether you're, you've got millions of pounds in the bank. Everybody needs to sit down and manage all of that money in one way or another. Now, I use this all the time. You may have seen it before if you've been in any of our sessions with Rugby League Cares. This is, the UK average salary is £25,000 per year. The vast majority of professional rugby league players earn over that national average. So they're above average earners and have capacity or should have capacity in their budget to make sure that we can do all our short term things over the next six to 12 months. We can look at some of our medium term objectives and we can also make sure that we're a member of that pension scheme and make contributions and contribute towards our long term financial goals. Now, there's two ways you can do this. You can either be really old and wise like me, open Excel up in Microsoft and have column A as the money you've got coming in and column B as all of the money that you've got going out. That's what you're seeing there on screen. That was just taken out of an Excel spreadsheet. Or um, if you're younger, you can get a fancy app to do that kind of stuff for you. Now, if you remember earlier on in the session, I was saying about transitioning and switching your current account to get better deals and even get paid for switching your current account. 
a lot of new current accounts come with budgeting apps built into them to help you decipher where your money's going, where you might be able to save five or 10 pounds here or there to perhaps start a savings account for those medium term objectives like transitioning from rugby league or starting a family or moving into a bigger house because you've started a family, those kinds of things. So you can see how it's easy to build that stuff together. Whatever happens, you are going to need to um, make sure that despite the interest rates, the cost of living increases that we've seen, the Bank of England base rate going up, that we still try to maintain a certain element of savings towards the things that we want to achieve. Now, if you're really, really lazy, you probably get 1% on your savings accounts. If you've not been down to your bank and checked what you're getting on your accounts and you've had them for the last 10 years or so, or five years or so, they're not going to increase them for you. It's up to you to shop around to find a better one. And you need to be earning in the current climate more than 3% growth on the money that you've got. If you're thinking about starting a little transition fund, just a, you know, maybe six to six and a half thousand pounds that you want to have available to you to undertake training or transition from rugby league into a new career path. Well, I think that would be a very handy amount of money to have at that point. It's three pounds 28 a day. And if you just review where your money's going, you can get easily more than three percent. You can actually, if you lock it in and don't touch it, get nearer to 6%. So again, it's just a call to action. And if we are already savers, then maybe um, we can improve our savings journey a little bit. And when we do do that, I do want to make sure that people are putting their hard earned money somewhere where it's protected from at least tax on interest. And we use ISAs to do that. Now, ISAs are no different from ordinary bank and building society accounts. It just has the word ISA written on it, like it's wrapped in shiny wrapping paper. But they're exactly the same. They do they'll allow you a, a little bit of leeway as to how you're holding the money in there, whether that's just cash or whether that's invested in various different investment funds which are to do with holding stocks and shares to try to get your money to grow faster than the interest rate we earn from banks, which sadly, I'm afraid, is still below the increases that we've seen in the cost of living. So therefore, we might be losing out slightly. Just to explain to you in real simple terms how that works, if you've got £20 now, you can go out and buy £20 worth of goods and services. You can probably do that tomorrow as well. But this time next year, that £20 won't buy the same goods and services. And um, let's just, you know, say, for example, that you wanted to put it in the bank and earn 1% interest on it because you've not renegotiated your savings account. Well, you're going to have £20 and 20p next year, but we already know that you need something like £22 to £23 next year to keep buying the same products and services that you can buy today. So that's how you're losing out against the increase in cost of living. The only thing I do want to say on ISIS, because I know I'm very short on time and I need to come to an end in the next couple of, you know, in the next couple of minutes or so. The only thing I would say about ISIS, please do remember they've got, they've got security built into them. So they are underwritten by the financial services compensation scheme, which is that if something happens to your financial institution and the money is in an ISA, then you're protected up to the value of £85,000. Just something for you to bear in mind. And also, um, I know what you, I know you all know what a cash ISA is. And I know you all know what that stocks and shares ISA is and how it works. And you've been reading through the information that's there. I did just want to highlight lifetime ISAs. Um, because um, if you are under the age of 40, you can open a lifetime ISA. And the bonus on that is 25% on the money that you pay into it. And you did hear me correctly. It's 25%. It is capped at £4,000. But let's say you put 4000 in, then that would be uplifted to £5,000. And you're not going to get that rate of return anywhere else in any other kind of account. The only drawback is that you can only use it for the purchase of your first property or then later on in life as income, uh, pension income, if you like. If you withdraw the money for any other reason, you're probably going to get back less than you've paid in because they claw back 25% of the full amount. 
And very quickly, if you do the maths, if you paid in a thousand, if you paid in 800 pounds as an example, that would be bump, bumped up to a thousand pounds. But then 25% of that would be 250 pounds. So you'd only get, get back 750 pounds off your 800 pound investment in the first place. So yeah, that's that's how it works. If you need any explanations, drop a question in the Q&A side. And um, if you're over 40, as I know a few of you are on here, me included, just to let you know, you can get your kids to open them and then you can pay into them for them to help them to save up for a first house, which is what I'm doing with my older children in the vain hope that they move out sometime soon. Just want rid of them now. Uh, OK, before we wrap up, um, where can you go after today to get some more information on the stuff that I've been talking about? Because we have been very rushed to shoehorn in a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, you can go to lots and lots of different websites. First of all, if you or someone that you know has any issues with money or problems with debt, um, that's why we're here, because we can help to help them and talk to them and get them back on their feet. There are some great websites there from Citizens Advice Money, Help a Step Change, National Deadline. Um, if you go to Google, again, I mentioned their product name, aren't I? But if you go to Google and put in money worries or debt issues, um, you will be hit with a lot of commercial organizations that are offering to help you out. You do not need those commercial organizations. They're just charging fees and commissions for doing exactly the same thing as those organizations that you can see on the slide here. They are as good as any commercial organization and they can help you out much at a much lower cost um, than going through any commercial organization. So use those. Um, obviously, I've mentioned um, you know, various different supermarket websites for insurance-based products uh, and financial products themselves. Again, just some of them are on here, not all of them, but I would suggest now more than ever, if you don't use them, to get friendly with one of those sites um, and get your information in there. They can actually help you manage that as well and give you reminders of when things are coming up for renewal. And lastly, um, for general money stuff, we've got the Money Helper, Money Saving Expert and Money Facts. They're all equally very good. Um, but again, without promoting a product or a service, Martin Lewis's MoneySavingExpert.com website is the number one place to go for day-to-day -day money management stuff and information on everything that we've spoken about in this webinar. You can ask us any questions anytime because we're here and we give our time to Rugby League Cares to help anybody associated with Rugby League. But if you want to go online and just do it for yourself, go on Money Saving Expert and at the very least sign up to their weekly newsletter as well because you get offers from time to time. You even get things like free McDonald's and free Nando's from time to time as well. So really good stuff for uh, not not just me, but for the, the you know the older kids that we've got in the household here as well, for them to go away and enjoy a freebie on as well. So I have managed to talk for a very long time. We didn't want to go over 45 minutes with our webinar, but we're just on the cusp of that time now. In the background, Mark's been looking at any questions and comments that have been raised. And Steve, also, if you want to switch your camera and your microphone back on and join me on the webinar, um, hopefully we can turn over to Mark and ask, how's it been going, Mark, in the background? You've been going steady, Aid. Very <laughs> steady. Thank you very much indeed. You've you're taking pity on me. I love that. He's got nothing else to do. Uh, <laughs> to be fair, that was right tonight. Um, I do say that in work time as well, when we're fully yeah, being paid uh, by our clients to yeah, deliver this kind every, of thing. Every well, waking so. hour is work time, kid. Um, <laughs> uh, a couple of quickies, actually, for both of you. I've got one here for you, Aid, to begin yeah. with. Um, on that uh, whole arranging your budgeting and managing your money, any quick and easy tips or get uh, basically somebody wants somebody else to do it for them i yes. completely understand that <laughs> well i do have an excel spreadsheet which i use with which i've used with a few players on the yeah. way through the year and um, we also do have uh, like a, a, a printed one which i can electronically send mm -hmm. across if you want some ideas as to how to put a budget together but the other thing that you can do is go online and have a look at some of the online budget planners as well um, there are apps and websites that deal with that. I'm going to mention a few here because they're really interesting places to go and have a look at. And um, we've got Mint, uh, we've got Yolt, um, and the third one, which I uh, yours, uh, Mark, is Money Dashboard, isn't it? You use that one. I do. Uh, so <laughs> go on and look at Money Dashboard. Uh, the last one to mention is one called YNAB, which yeah. stands for You Need a Budget. And if you go online and have a look at that one, um, I believe they've just started charging for their services, but I've still got yep. a lot of free information on there as well. So go on okay. and, and have a look at those. Yeah. 
money dashboard is free you want my i'm not plugging it <laughs> yeah my, my stuff's cheap and free and easy it's all just emailable yeah. so um okay. give us a shout if you need it um uh, steve one for you um is this a one-off or are we likely to be running more of these no mark uh, with, with yourself and adrian hopefully mm. we can <clears throat> excuse me start to offer this provision potentially quarterly um right. and you know we're all we're always looking for feedback so you know if players want to feed back to their player welfare managers back at their clubs, any themes or any certain topics that they may want more information on, that'd be perfect. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. And Aid, back to you. Um, a couple of people have mentioned pensions. I've got two strands to this. The first is I've got I've moved clubs and I've picked up more than one pension. Is it easy to pull them together? It is, but it's not something you need to immediately do. So, Fine. you know, I would say to carry on with your playing career, concentrate on that. Mm. But just make sure if you're transitioning from club to club to club that you keep joining each club's pension scheme. Uh, and then later on in your playing career, we can have a look at consolidating some of those together and Got bringing it. them together. Uh, it, it doesn't cost any money. Uh, it, it's free to do. It's very simple to do. You know, it's not us selling a product or a service. We can just talk you through how it works and, and help you understand the process of bringing them together. But they are just like big savings accounts. So you can literally just choose which one is the best one and then close the others and bring them into that one. Uh, and then it's much easier to manage. Got it. The, the final one on that, which I thought was an interesting one, and it could clearly affect, a, well, it does affect a number of people on, on tonight's uh, webinar. Um, you may not spend the rest of your life in this country, so should you join a pension scheme? Um, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I have a simple view, which is if there is money that my employer is going to put into <laughs> a savings plan for me, um, I'm going to take it. Thank you very much indeed. But what are your thoughts? Uh, yes, no, 100% absolutely. Yeah. Because um, number one, while you are here, it's a very tax efficient way to get money Brilliant. put into an account which you can leave there. For uh, And again, if you then return back to another country, you can just leave it here. Yeah. It is invested. It will continue to grow. And you can come back and claim it at a later date and have it. Uh, you know, either either close it down and move it from that account to wherever you are. Or if you're maintaining an account in the UK, you can have it paid into account in the UK and have that money, you know, paid out and across to you. There's lots of different ways of doing it. But I'll go back to my original answer. Uh, yes, because your employer is giving you free money. <laughs> Why wouldn't you accept it? Thank you very much indeed. Listen, that's all from me. But thank you, both of you very much. No indeed. Um, Steve, do you want the final word on the webinar this evening? Just a big thank you, Mark uh, and Adrian, to yourselves for your time. Um, it's been fantastic. I, I've personally learned so much this evening, and I hope that can be said the same of the people that have joined into the webinar this evening. And just thank you so much and looking forward to doing something like this again in the near future. No problem. Well, um, thanks everybody. Thanks very much, everybody, for joining us. And, and thanks, Steve, for doing the intros and the outros. And uh, I just hope we get the opportunity to do this again sometime soon. Have a great evening, everybody.